I've been asked to investigate a man called Brian Brewer, a giant in the field of lipoprotein metabolism. My search started on Medline, where I found his name on nearly 500 publications. Hmm, the man has definitely been busy. Brian is from Casper, Wyoming, a little town of 50,000 people. His father and mother were both pharmacists. A wide-ranging interview he gave to the American Journal of Cardiology a few years ago is full of interesting details, like the fact that he can customize a car, change an engine, and even knows how to ride horses. But just who is the man behind all the outstanding accomplishments? I was curious and made my way to the European Atherosclerosis Society meeting in Istanbul to gather more information about this remarkable scientist. Uh, Brian uh, is not young, but he looks young. And uh, he's strong, very strong. He's never tired. You know, as an undergraduate student, as a graduate student, as an independent investigator, I've been reading Brian's paper for 30 years. But then you get to meet this wonderful, warm uh, human being, uh, quite funny, actually very humble, and it's, it's, it's remarkable to see all that package in the same man. He's an absolutely brilliant scientist. He has really contributed so much to the understanding of lipoprotein metabolism. To be honest, finding Brewer was easy. He was at nearly all sessions as an attendee, speaker, or chairman. In fact, the hardest task was finding time to take him out for a drink. I asked him why he became interested in cholesterol in the early 80s, especially when an editorial in the British Heart Journal had reached the following conclusion in 1976. The view that raised plasma cholesterol is per se a cause of coronary heart disease is untenable. I was always very interested in cardiology, and as you, as you say, there was a very uh, clear uh, indication that patients had risk factors for cardiovascular disease, but it was not so clear that cholesterol was a risk factor. And when it became clear it was a risk factor, it was not clear that lowering the cholesterol would change your risk factor. So because the lipoproteins were elevated in those patients, I became very interested in the potential role of the lipoproteins and the cholesterol as risk factors for heart disease. In 1970, Brian was deep into peptide chemistry. In fact, he was head of this section of the Molecular Disease Branch at the National Institute of Health. Don Fredrickson, the NIH director at the time, asked him if he'd be interested in characterizing the newly discovered apolipoproteins in plasma lipoproteins. Well, the Don Fredrickson was a very unique individual along with uh, Bob Levy and other colleagues, they began to characterize the patients that had high cholesterol and to identify those at risk for cardiovascular disease. And so uh, he was the one that interested me in determining the structure of the proteins of the uh, LDL or the bad cholesterol and HDL, the good cholesterol. Brewer started his research in 1976. He was appointed chief of the molecular disease branch. He remained in that position until 2005. Uh, clearly, the, uh, one of the most, I think, interesting areas for me over the years was the, was the isolation, the characterization of the HDL lipoproteins and understanding what proteins uh, were on HDL and the structure of those proteins and then what was the function. And one of the major functions that we've learned is that the HDL is able to remove the cholesterol from a cholesterol-filled cell uh, in the coronary artery. And that became a fascinating part of the story was how HDL was able to remove the cholesterol that accumulates and gives you uh, heart disease, how HDL could do that. 
And that really led me to the study of the patients with Tangier's disease, because Tangier's disease uh, are the patients that actually are characteristically have a very low level of HDL and have uh, increased risk of heart disease. And the defect in those patients turned out to be a defect in a, a transporter on the cell surface that HDL binds to, so that we learned a great piece of the puzzle of how HDL worked by the study of patients with Tangier's disease with the discovery of the ABCA1 transporter. And that turned out to be the way in which HDL is able to take cholesterol out of the cell is that the HDL binds to that transporter and removes the excess cholesterol and takes it back to the liver. One of Brewer's strengths is his ability to integrate the fantastic advances in biotechnology that have occurred in the past decades. Early on, we had the development of the technology to do the structure of the proteins, and that was a major advance at that time frame, which was now nearly 30 years ago. But that technology allowed us to do the sequencing much more rapidly, and we were able to determine the structure of the proteins. As the technology involved making a radio-labeled protein, injecting it in, and being able to look at the, the degree of metabolism and also to do uh, what are called cold isotope studies, where you begin to be able to look at the patients who had a high level or a low level of a lipoprotein, such as HDL, and we were able to show, for example, in Tangier patients, that by radio labeling the protein moiety, the ApoA1, injecting it into the patient, you were able to determine that the reason they had such a low level of HDL was not that they didn't make the protein or the HDL, but it was rapidly catabolized. So we learned by those new techniques at that time what was really the reason for the low level of HDL. As the field progressed, we began to have the opportunity to put genes into animal models. And that was really a, a very exciting and interesting area because for the first time we could put genes in or knock genes out in an animal model and see the effect, for example, in our field in lipoproteins. So we used those cell biology and molecular biology techniques to be able to answer the question, well, what if we raised HDL by turning on the gene that makes HDL, turning on the A1 gene, would we decrease atherosclerosis in an animal model? And we did those types of studies and also looked at what happened when you didn't have the protein, which gave us a great deal of new information about the importance of HDL and allowed us to look more specifically at the genes that were regulating the lipoproteins. Now in the early 21st century, we wonder how Brewer envisions new treatment programs for patients. It's very clear that the public funds uh, which are generated uh, by the NIH and, and uh, sources like NIH to, in the world to develop uh, research uh, clearly plays a major role, but so does industry as well as the biotech companies. The development of, of long-term treatment patients with the morbidity and mortality studies are clearly very expensive. The small biotech company can't do that. And what they have to do in terms of the development is as they develop a different type of program is they have to partner with a, usually a larger pharmaceutical company to have the uh, resources to do the very expensive long-term uh, morbidity and mortality studies. So it really, I think, is turning out that it's a combination of both basic research, many times done with public funds. Uh, the biotech industry do, does the basic research in some of the initial clinical trials, and then the pharmaceutical industry or the large resource uh, agencies are able to carry it through to the um, morbidity and mortality studies. In 1980, the Bay Dole Act was an innovative incentive for technology transfer. It created an economic partnership triangle among government, universities and private industry. Is this still true 35 years later? That's a real challenge because I think that because of the intellectual property rights as you develop a program, uh, the uh, resources that have been utilized to develop that type of uh, information can be patented. Uh, it's clear that then that uh, restricts other people unless they uh, cooperate and develop a program with the individual who's patented. And I think 
that many times there is a competition to get patents and then there's a competition of who's going to develop them after the, the patent has been obtained. And I think that there's a good part to that and a bad part. The good part is that the development of competition uh, very frequently moves the things faster as people try to develop new information. So competition in that sense is healthy. It becomes, uh, when the technology transfer becomes a limitation, then it can be an implement uh, to uh, actually slowing things down. And I think it, uh, is a challenge for the biomedical research community now of how to, to develop this so that we get an effective development of these new information and the new resources. And many times it's a complicated one to get it uh, effectively completed. For the young investigator, what the challenge is for the biomedical research community and also for the government is to develop the resources to keep the individual able to pursue a research career. Obviously, it's a challenge uh, with the uh, research costs that are currently developing to be able to maintain the research productivity that the United States has had over the last uh, decade to keep that type of productivity. We have to be very careful not to lose the resources that have been so important in developing individuals' careers in biomedical research and being able to maintain the productivity. And this is a problem worldwide now, is to have adequate resources to do the research that's necessary for the future. Brian Brewer left the NIH in 2005. Retired, I'm not sure he knows the word. He is currently the director of lipoprotein and atherosclerosis research at the MedStar Research Institute, a large academic hospital in Maryland. What is he running for? Uh, the major interest I currently have is to develop a program for the treatment of patients uh, with the high-density lipoproteins or the good cholesterol. We've learned the techniques of being able to do clinical trials and infusions of, of lipoproteins and apoproteins, and that's the, the next piece of the puzzle that we've been able to use a new technology with the developing of imaging techniques in man to look at what really is happening in the coronary artery. So with these new techniques, such as the imaging techniques, we're able to give, for example, an infusion of HDL and see if that changes the plaque in the coronary artery. So these, each one of these major advances in biotechnology have been applied to the field, and it's allowed us to gain more and more information about the role of the lipoproteins, but also how to change them and how to potentially develop new therapy for the patient. My work here is done. Brian Brewer is enjoying the view. Who knows what he's thinking? It's time for me to make my exit. Mm -hmm.